So it's been a minute since we've recorded. I think maybe like almost a month. Uh, you've been literally traveling yeah. all over. <laughs> <laughs> I can't I have, keep up. I have called the world my home. Yeah, that's for sure <laughs> true. But what a wonderful episode to come back to. This was so needed. Mm. You just need to have some time to stand still and think about these things. And I really loved it. Can you tell mm -hmm. our audience a little bit more about our guest today? Yes, I am so excited because we, one of my favorite parts about this podcast, honestly, is getting to, to talk to thought leaders and awesome authors. And Joseph Wynn is, I, I think this is one of my favorite episodes we've done, literally. He is a global bestseller of the book, Don't Believe Everything You Think. This book has been translated to 40 languages, millions of people have read it. And what I love so much about it is he's able to distill information from all different philosophy, spirituality, psychology, and put it into this very understandable text that you can apply literally today. I mean, I yeah. personally am applying unthinking as much as I can, even in this moment. And he, we talk about things like flow and how highly sensitive can sometimes struggle with putting fires out for everyone else and how they can work on that. But my favorite thing about him, I don't know if you picked this up, but he has such a, a loving energy about him. Mm, like you can really so tell. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. He really does live what he preaches. And for sure. I think if, if, of course, most of our audience is hopefully highly sensitive people. <laughs> but if you or struggle, know someone who is, <laughs> yeah, if you struggle with your thoughts and, and getting into those little moments of overthinking and thinking in a circle and, you know, distinguishing between positive and negative thinking, you're going to love this episode. It's so well put. Sure. And I hope you enjoy it as much as we did. Welcome to the Sensitivity Doctors Podcast. Here we explore everything from overcoming anxiety to living in a world not always designed for our sensitive wiring. Whether it's navigating business, parenthood, overcoming trauma, or getting what you want out of your relationships, we invite you to this empowering journey of self-compassion and growth. Sit back, relax, and here are your hosts. Well, welcome. And, you know, to get started, it would be helpful if you wouldn't mind maybe sharing a little bit about what led you down this path and made you want to write this book in the first place, because I'm truly excited to hear that. Yeah, it's it's a little bit of a longer story. <laughs> uh, Cliff it, notes. It, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, they always say, like, it takes a lifetime, you know, to, to write a book and especially the first book. And so mm -hmm. that was very much the case for mine. Although mm -hmm. I wrote it in a relatively short amount of time, mm -hmm. it, it, it took all my life experiences to, to be put into that book, even though it was less than 100 pages. Mm -hmm. So the reason why I ended up writing it was, I mean, I believe that the greatest books come from the author's greatest pains. And mm -hmm. that was very much true for my book. And mm -hmm. I was suffering from chronic anxiety, running a business, and not really having a, a purpose with my life. I didn't feel like I had one and running around in circles mm -hmm. and eventually it got so bad that um i mean i was like losing clients it was really difficult I had a bad business partner mm -hmm. split and just all of these things my uh my partner at the time now wife she had uh different chronic illnesses that mm -hmm. had her hospitalized multiple times and then she had to get a feeding tube eventually oh, oh my so goodness. so it was a pretty difficult time yeah with all of that and i was probably around 21 at the time and mm -hmm. went into 50 grand worth wow. of debt after the business partner split. Yeah. That's and young. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I went through, I mean, of course, there's plenty of other people that have been through so many worse things. And it's, mm -hmm. there's no point to compare, but that's just what I was going through at the time. And so it was I'll very difficult. I'll validate that was pretty terrible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll second I mean, I that. Feel like goes, I feel like everyone yeah. goes through something very, very terrible. And Agreed. Um, I think that's just a human, a human thing. And mm -hmm. it's not really about the things that we go through, but how we view those things, which is what changes how we live our lives, how we view our lives and, and how much peace or happiness that we have. So that that to me, during that time, it was not great. And so I kind of spiraled, went, fell into, you can call it like a depression mm -hmm. and didn't really know what to do with my life anymore. I didn't love my work anymore. Um, I, ironically, I did accomplish a lot of the goals that I set out to, to accomplish, such as making X amount of money, um, having my own business and things like that. But 
after doing that, it felt emptier than when I began. Mm. So that's that was kind of the final straw that that really put the nail in the coffin for me to to at least do something different because we, there's no point in changing if there's no pain. Mm. Um, so right. that that's the point in which everything changed for me was when I hit rock bottom. Mm. And then I started seeking solutions and I was seeking solutions everywhere I possibly could. So trying therapy, you know, CBT and then uh, hypnotherapy, trying energy healing like Reiki and then even um, tons of meditations, transcendental meditation, um, studying different religions, philosophies, um, going vegan for, for a while, uh, mm. acupuncture, acupressure, pretty much as much as I could try. I, I, mm-hmm. I did it. Yeah. And the most interesting part about that was that the majority of the modalities worked. Mm. The issue that came up for me was they worked only while I was doing the modality. That's so an example point. of that is if I'm meditating, it's 10 minutes of, of pretty decent bliss after I was doing it for a few weeks and was able to kind of calm the mind. But as soon as I opened my eyes and then had to go back to work, all of the anxiety came back. So Mm. 10 minutes invested for a few minutes of relief afterwards didn't seem like a great investment for me. And that was the case for almost everything that I was doing at the time. And uh, now I learned that that was more of a user error than than a modality (laughs) error, right? So, so, but, but that, that became so, so intriguing to me. And I was like, why do I only feel peace during a meditation, but not outside of it? And mm-hmm. that was when I started to realize that I wasn't bringing a meditative state into my day. So whatever mm-hmm. I was practicing in meditation, I wasn't doing outside of it. Because to me, it didn't make any sense. How am I supposed to just not think while mm-hmm. I'm working, while I'm doing emails, while I'm talking to other people? It doesn't, it, how am I supposed to just observe and just let go? I'm just going to be a potato when in front of other people it just so that mm-hmm. didn't make sense until i realized that it, it really wasn't about not thinking it's about letting the thoughts come and go and not being attached to it and not believing everything that that comes into the mind let's say if a person did something that really upsets me a thought will come in and say that person is not a good person they're terrible or they're selfish or whatever and if i believe that then i'm going to feel anger resentment And all these things towards the other person but if i recognize that thought and just let it pass then i can come back into the present moment and be with them Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. and actually understand them rather than just assuming uh whatever i had in my own mind so that was really the progression of of what happened and yeah eventually i just had that epiphany and i was studying many different people like michael neal and sydney banks and a lot of them helped me understand these principles and and help me have that that kind of like epiphany moment where I, I stopped believing everything that was in my mind and saw where peace actually comes from, which is less about controlling thoughts and more and more about letting go of the thoughts. Um, freedom doesn't come from control; it comes from letting go. Mm. And so that was the the discovery that that really changed my life. And then I wrote the book shortly after that. <laughs> Yeah, which I am so thrilled with. I was saying to you earlier, your your book has spoken to me directly. Um, at I think the exact right time I needed to read it, so I, I will definitely unpack that a little. But I I saw myself seeing my clients differently this week when they were coming mm-hmm. in, where they're unpacking and they're unpacking and they're unpacking all these thoughts and these thoughts, and I found myself wanting to say, "Hold on." have you read this book? Because maybe you don't have to feel everything you're thinking. And I don't know if anyone Mm. wants to hear that from their therapist, but luckily my rapport is pretty good and and people trust me enough to to bite a little bit at the bait I'm offering. Um, And I really resonated with the idea that you present of unthinking and non-thinking. And I wonder if you were to describe what it means to non-think or unthink, what that would look like. And I know you described this very well in the entire book, but for people just tuning in or listening and wanting to know how to do this, how would you describe it? And you kind of started to describe it, but specifically. Yes. So there's a difference between thoughts and thinking, which is probably the, the, the crucible of the entire text. And the difference between thought and thinking 
knowing that is, is where peace comes from. So thought, mm. an example of thought is it is essentially a neutral observation or intuitive prompting. Um, an example of that could be it is raining. That is a thought that comes in. It's neutral. That's an observation. Okay. Thinking, on the other hand, is a negative judgment or story mm. about the thoughts that we are having. That is self-imposed mm. and self-created. An example mm -hmm. of that would be, so the thought would be, it is raining. Thinking would be, this ruined my day. I'm so unlucky. Mm. Why does this mm. always happen to me? So that is where all the suffering comes from. It's that judgment mm. that we have of our thoughts. The thoughts mm. themselves, they, they, they really have no effect on us unless we believe them to be true. Mm. So the right. distinction, that's the distinction between the two. Non-thinking is essentially, it doesn't mean no thought. It simply means not thinking about the thoughts that we're having or not judging the thoughts that we are having. And once we're able to observe it and let go of it, it no longer affects us. It's, it's mm. just like water that comes in through a river. And if there's something floating in it, and if we let it pass, then it's gone from, from that yeah. part of the river. But if we hold on to it, then all of this sediment starts to build up, like uh, a lot of debris and all this stuff. And then a, a dam is created and then it blocks the river. That blockage mm. is what we feel in our hearts, in our souls. And that's what creates the pain and suffering. Mm. It's that it's that holding on to the thought, um, and and that becomes uh, quite painful for us. Mm. What about a thought like, "Oh, I love the rain." <laughs> so that's a fantastic question. So that <laughs> just that to me, there you can do positive. There's um, you can do like positive thinking and things like that, mm -hmm. while there's nothing wrong with it at all. And I mm -hmm. highly encourage people to, to do it because that's like the next step forward, so to speak, after letting go of negative thinking. Um, I asked myself, where, where does peace actually come from or happiness and joy? And does it come from only when we are saying something positive about the situation that we're in? Does it mm -hmm. require a narration of it? Mm -hmm. So, and another, another way to phrase that question is, is the only time I'm happy when I'm thinking to myself, I am happy or like, mm. I'm very grateful for this thing. Or is it possible to experience it without it? Mm. So that was a very big moment for me because if, if I didn't understand that, then I just would believe that every situation I go into, every circumstance, I would have to say, I'm so grateful. I am love. I am, I am gratitude. I am joy. And that's the only time I can ever experience it. But that would make me go crazy because <laughs> well, I would just I would just be stuck in my thought mm -hmm. and not actually living it, my life. I, I would be thinking right. about my life mm -hmm. uh, versus living it. So while positive thinking can, can definitely be very helpful, I realize that it's not always necessary to find peace, joy or love. And many times we're able to experience it more deeply when we kind of let go of even needing to label it as good or bad. And we get to feel it in its entirety because um, thought is so limited. When we're right. narrating something, let's say we're recounting a, uh, an experience that we have with a friend and then we say something and they're like, they're not really getting it, even though it was really funny. And it's like, oh, you just had to be there. And mm. that is partly true because there's just so much to explain and, and words can only capture a very small amount of, of what that experience of life is. It's like it's trying. It's like if someone asks you, you know, who are you? Like, how are you supposed to explain the entirety of your life in, mm. in, in a few words? So. That, that, so when we let go of kind of just needing to narrate everything in our lives, thinking about everything in our lives, that's when we actually drop in and are truly present and can, can, can really experience the, the, the fullness of it because it's, it's ineffable really at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate that distinction because, well, first of all, one of my favorite things about the book, and I listened to it even though I also have a copy, but I just I really enjoyed hearing your voice <laughs> as you were reading it. And so I would pause at the moments where you offer these really amazing kind of thought exercises. Those are and my favorite. Yes, they're so good. I will say I did. I felt like I won the quiz when you asked about the sediment. And I was like, well, you just sit and wait for it to, to drop. So <laughs> I'm like, I win. <laughs> um, but when you, I think my absolute favorite one out of the entire book, if you don't mind me sharing the one. Of course, is, I don't mind is the one about thinking about a time in your life where you were absolutely joyful and yes. what were you feeling versus what were you thinking? And I thought about this moment at my wedding where me and everyone I loved were dancing and we were all just 
free and fluid and it was just so silly and fun and crazy and I can like feel what that felt like. And then when you said, what were you thinking? I thought, um, I like this. I started kind of fabricating <laughs> what I might have been thinking. Making up something, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like making up what I would have been thinking, but you're so right. Like I wasn't thinking, I was just experiencing. Um, and I And I appreciate you distinguishing that in something maybe a little less fantastic as, you know, beautiful rain outside that I, I could almost see where the thinking can be positive, like you're saying, but if you're not really well practiced, it can easily slip into negative thinking. Like if you thought, I love the rain. And then you thought, well, is it okay if it stops raining? What about it? And then like kind of exactly. going through this rabbit mm -hmm. hole as a result of the thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what happens if it's a, a hurricane rain? Do you still like the rain? If it's damaging <laughs> your house and there's a roof leaking? So like, so that w when we start thinking positively in that regard, it, it opens us up to opposing thoughts or contradictory thoughts. Mm -hmm. And then we have this mental, mental war. And that's mm -hmm. why when, when we say to ourselves, oh, I'm so confident, I am amazing, I am all these things. What happens when life doesn't feel that way? Now mm -hmm. there's a contradiction and there's this kind of split between, between our psyche. What's, what's true? What's not? And so when we drop the labels, though, and we see things just as they are without needing to say good, bad, right, wrong, then we're like, oh, this is, this is what life is. No matter mm -hmm. what I label it, mm -hmm. it, it still is. And so dropping the story, dropping all of the judgment really helps just mm -hmm. us experience more peace that that's at the end of the day is like the the, the core message of the book and mm -hmm. and and it, it's uh like you were saying amelia it's when we drop thinking it's not like we don't feel anything mm. it's completely possible to experience a whole range of emotions if not all of them even more deeply when we don't continuously think about it and this goes for positive or negative emotions. I mean, there aren't really positive or negative. It's just all emotions. It's it's part of our part of our bodies. Um, and so when we when we do that, then we're like, oh, okay, it passes more quickly if there is something mm -hmm. that is quite uncomfortable mm -hmm. because That's we're not holding point. on to it. We're not uh, kind of reliving that cycle constantly. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. same thing with the, the positive ones, right? Let's say if a positive experience comes by and which, which creates positive experiences or emotions, then we're not attached to it. And once it passes, we're like, oh, I, it's it's not like it used to be. Or like we were so in love back then and now we're not. Oh, and so, yeah. it's, so like it, there's such a big trap when we start labeling mm -hmm. these things too much um, and, and becoming too attached to it. So it, it's it's so it's so freeing, right? It's like, what's more important? Is, is it more important for you to be right? Or is it more important for you to be free? Um, mm -hmm. and, and to me, like freedom is more important than anything else at this point mm -hmm. in terms of freedom of mind. And, mm. and from that, then I'll, I'll, I'll prioritize my peace rather than trying to make a situation be a certain way, um, or anything like that. Um, it's a much more organic way of living life and a lot more fun, at least. Yeah, I could see that. <laughs> I love how you put that because it, this is one of the big things for me as well in my journey is, um, that I, you know, realize to live by the words, you know, there's no secret to happiness because life always happens. And this is one of my big challenges with self-help and this rhetoric that you have to have this positive way of thinking and you need to get yourself into this vibe. And then exactly what you said, life happens. And then, mm -hmm. you know, that all kind of comes crumbling down. And unfortunately, if you are a highly sensitive person, then you are many times wired to be a perfectionist as well. So when you read these books and these narratives, you go into it thinking, oh, I'm going to ace this. I'm going to do this right. I'm gonna... Are we talking about me being excited <laughs> that I passed the sediment quiz? <laughs> <laughs> right. No. But... Yeah, what happens if you don't pass the next quiz in the book? <laughs> but, you know, like you make it like your goal and then it's so much more devastating when life inevitably happens and it just doesn't work out that way because you know, that's, I think, part of our human experience is to go through these challenges and to see how they work and fit into the puzzle that is our own lives. Um, and I just love the way that you bring that together in taking away from the thinking 
and always doing like the positive thinking versus the experiencing because life is the ultimate experience. Yeah, it's not, it's not an outcome. And, and something that you brought up, Gene, is like that I really enjoy is kind of like letting go. Well, most of the time we're too attached to outcomes. Mm. Mm-hmm. And, th- and another word for outcomes is just expectations. So mm-hmm. if we're expecting us to get this promotion or have our partner act a certain way and all these things, that opens us up for Mm. many different opportunities for us to emotionally suffer because more times than not life will not go the way that we expect Mm -hmm. it's it's there's very little that we can possibly control and so for us to say it must go this way in order for us to be happy that's essentially what we're saying when we create these pseudo goals or expectations of other people of our even ourselves Mm. um so it becomes very dangerous to do that in terms of our uh, mental health and that then puts all the emphasis on the outcome rather than the process. Yeah. Mm. And then we lose sense of joy for the present moment. Mm-hmm. So let's say, for example, we're working in a job, but then we really want that promotion or more money or more whatever. All that we're doing in the interim of accomplishing that is now a means to an end. Mm-hmm. And we see it as an obstacle, something we have to do, something that's necessary. And now it's grueling because we're not there yet. And so our entire present moment which is essentially our entire lives. We're only ever in the present moment unless we're thinking about the past or future. This is all we have. Yet we're living for something that will never really come. And once it does, let's say you do get the promotion. Now we're looking for the next one. Mm-hmm. And so mm. we just we just move the goalpost. And now we realize, oh my gosh, like now we hate running, right? And we just fell mm-hmm. in love with, with, the, with the finish line. And now our entire lives is just one blip of maybe happiness for a couple minutes. And then the rest mm-hmm. of the time, the majority of our lives is now spent suffering because mm-hmm. we're not there yet. Um, but when we drop those goalposts and realize, oh, like what what feels really expansive to me in this moment? What what feels inspiring to me? And we live and go from that place. Now we are living in the present and we mm-hmm. are falling in love with the doing rather than whatever the outcome is. And and I mean, you you know this too, like it's like when we put our best into whatever we're doing in the present moment, the outcome is generally better because we're doing everything we possibly can rather than being so attached to the outcome and trying to manipulate our way there. Um, and so if we, I mean, love will take us much further than, than sheer effort ever will. And the only reason why mm-hmm. anyone stays doing anything for an extensive amount of time is, uh, especially when it's so painful and grueling and difficult is because they truly love it. And mm. those are the people that are at the top of their fields, like the artists, the, the scientists, and anyone that, that stays in it long enough. That, that's why it's, 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 much, it's a much bigger reason than the goal itself. Um, yeah. Otherwise, they'll just find out it's not worth it and leave. And that's why a lot of like surgeons, things like that, there's like a huge trend on in, 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 the, in the States right now where tons of surgeons, tons of doctors are now leaving the practice because they, they were just optimizing for the wrong goal and, and didn't realize mm-hmm. that. Um, and so it, it's very interesting to see how people are, are kind of waking up now and are like, Oh, I I don't want to live my life this way anymore. Um, and I, I want to be happy now. And I want to figure out a way to, to enjoy this, whatever I'm doing rather than just constantly living for a future that never comes. I'm so glad you brought this up because this is a part of your book that I was really excited to talk to you about. And I also want to touch on uh, highly sensitive wiring too, because that's another good one, but the deprivation versus inspiration. So this came to me at the exact moment I needed it because I have been trying to put together a book proposal for months now. And I've been doing it, I think, from a a have to kind of mentality. And even the structure of it and everything, it just wasn't, something wasn't clicking. And so I read your book and I thought, okay, I'm going to not do this because I don't have to do this. This is not an ends to a mean. This is not something, this is something I normally love. Writing is something I normally love and I'm turning it into, well, now I'm being known as this prolific person that just puts books upon books out. Like maybe it's okay for me to slow down. And so right at that moment, I had this interview for something and they asked me about my next book. And without thinking about the book proposal, I started organically talking about it. And in the talking and in the connecting with someone without trying, I suddenly figured out everything I was stuck on just through conversation and connection. Mm. And then I went back to the proposal 
And I looked at my husband. I said, I'm just going to work on this for like five minutes, if you don't mind. And then we can, you know, watch that show or whatever we were going to do. An hour and 20 minutes goes by. <laughs> and I look up at the clock and I look at him and I go, why didn't you stop me? <laughs> he, goes, he goes, I don't know. You look like you were in your flow. So I didn't want to interrupt. It was wild. Like it was one of those, like I felt pulled mm. to the proposal and I was so excited about what happened. And so it was like, I really had to stop thinking about the end result. Absolutely. Mm. I had to stop thinking yeah. basically based on what you're saying. Um, so I'm so grateful for that. Like you, I will, I will credit you in, in this book whenever <laughs> it comes out. Um, but you know, I actually applied your deprivation versus, um, inspiration yeah. to a client yesterday who is struggling with online dating. So this client has been working in a deprivation model with the fear that he's going to miss out on that right person. Aww. And he's been almost kind of hooked in and uh, anxious and overly attached to the apps. And it, it's become almost like this chore. And we were noticing a connection between the times of day he was using it and the times his depression symptoms were increasing. And so we were talking about what would it feel like? What would the experience be like if it wasn't about finding your person and it was just about the fun of connecting, mm. just, just the feeling of it. And so I, I, it was really interesting to see how something like this deprivation versus inspiration and pulling away from all the thinking and problem solving and planning could also not just be applied to, you know, a passion or a job or something like that, but it can also be applied to finding, you know, someone to love. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. That's a beautiful way of, of applying it into so many different things. And that, that was my hope for the book is that people would take whatever principles are there, but applying it to many different avenues of life and not just whatever I was talking about at the moment, because that's what principles are. If, if we're operating based off of first principles, they, they work everywhere rather than mm. just one singular case. And that makes problem solving a lot easier uh, rather than needing a hundred different tools to just hammer one nail, so to speak. So, mm. and and yeah, the story of, of what you were sharing with the client is, is just beautiful because it, it kind of allowed him to stop thinking about dating in the same way that he was. Mm -hmm. And that then would change his experience of whatever mm -hmm. dating is. And there's probably a reason why he, he, feels that way too, other than his thinking, right? He, there's a reason why he's on the apps. Like, what is he looking for? Mm -hmm. What, what is he, he is looking for the one person, right? But like, what is not looking for the person? What is he looking to feel at the end oh. of the day? Right. I didn't all, ask him that. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it, it, that's essentially what all, all of us are optimizing for. We're all wanting to, any action that we do is motivated by an emotion. Mm. What emotion do we want to feel? A lot of times, if we are feeling a lot of emotional pain, we will resort to some sort of addictions. So either drugs or overeating mm. or escaping in all sorts of different ways, scrolling social media for, for hours on end. These things are, are an avoidance of emotions. And on the flip side of that, when we're trying to pursue certain emotions, why do we want to buy that big house or the fancy car or like these nice purses, wallets? Mm. It's, it's to feel significant. It's to feel important. Mm. We don't care about the Rolex. It doesn't tell time better than a Walmart watch, but it makes us feel a certain way and that's why we buy it. Um, mm -hmm. Same goes for anything. We want money to feel security or to feel freedom. And mm. so once we find out what, what's, what's the core emotion that's motivating our actions, then it's time to investigate and ask ourselves, how can we feel this now mm. instead of waiting for that thing? Is there a way that we can feel this emotion independent of our circumstances rather than mm -hmm. depending on our, on our circumstances to feel that way? Because all circumstances are fleeting. Mm -hmm. So that's when it, it becomes so amazing because then you start to see, oh, I can feel joy no matter what I'm going through or whatever. Or I, can I can feel peace no matter what I'm going through. And um, this is why a lot of people can go through traumatic experiences or similar traumatic experiences but have completely different trajectories in life. How is that possible mm -hmm. when they went through seemingly the same thing? Mm -hmm. And so that was because they, 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 
change their thinking around it or even drop their thinking around that situation. And they won't, they realize that their past is, is doesn't have to affect who they are now. Mm-hmm. And it, it doesn't have to be the driving force behind it. And they can make that decision. And that's one of the greatest powers that we have as humans is, mm-hmm. is agency, is choice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Animals don't really have that as much. And so they are kind of uh, prone or kind of waiting for natural selection to take place in order to evolve. But as mm-hmm. humans, we can evolve in real time because of the, the capacity we have to choose differently. Mm-hmm. So it is, it is an amazing gift that we have that we can exercise at any moment of, do I want to keep, is, is this thinking serving me? Is it making mm-hmm. me feel the way that I want or not? And in a moment's notice, we can change that and, and change how we feel about our reality. Mm. I love that. And mm-hmm. you, had, you had mentioned um, certain kind of labels for skills that you would recommend to someone if they did find they were overthinking? Was it pause yes. or something yes, along those lines? Yes, pause is the, is the methodology. And it's quite mm-hmm. simple. Um, in short, it's really just pausing whenever we're, or even recognizing when we're emotionally suffering and using mm-hmm. that as a trigger to pause. Mm-hmm. Um, that is the beginning of changing our wiring and our behavior. So that's mm-hmm. the first word, which is pause. Pause and take deep breaths to mm-hmm. ground yourself in the present moment and within your body. Mm-hmm. That's why people generally do yoga or something like that. You know, if meditation is too difficult to sit there, they'll, they're moving their bodies and it's a little bit more physical. So it's whatever's engaging your physical body, it's a lot harder to think. Like mm-hmm. try to overthink while you're, while you're running. It's quite difficult. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you're you're more, more so focused on how difficult the running actually is or on your breathing. So engaging in some sort of uh, bodily action really helps us throughout. So pause, take deep breaths. A is the next letter. So that's ask. Ask yourself, is this thinking making me feel the way that I want? Mm. Then you is understand. Understand that you have the choice to let go at any moment Mm -hmm. of the thinking that we're doing. Then S is say. Say and repeat the mantra, thinking is the root cause of suffering. Mantras Mm. serve many different purposes, but some of the most notable ones and influential ones are that when we repeat a mantra, it's very difficult to think about anything else other than the mantra. So that essentially stops the thinking uh, and its tracks. The second is that the words that the mantra actually are composed of are quite powerful in influencing our own feelings and our behaviors. Uh, so if we are rooting ourselves in a, in a mantra that is truth, um, or at least as close to the truth as we can possibly get, then it should be liberating in that sense. So when we're repeating to ourselves, thinking is the root cause of suffering, we're reminding ourselves that, oh, I don't have to, if I'm thinking, I'm just going to keep suffering. And so it's reminding mm. us of the pain that we're causing ourselves. And like I was saying before, uh, most of us only change when we feel enough pain. And so it's mm. reminding us, okay, this is why we're causing, this is where the pain's coming from. And any person that realizes where their pain's coming from, they're going to stop it at some point. Once the pain is bad enough, no one's going to leave their hand on the stove for very long when they realize that the stove is, is the problem. But if their entire body is burning and there's no heat source, they're quite confused about what's causing it. And so they will try to attribute it to anything. And so it becomes very difficult to problem solve. And we might say, oh, maybe it's our pet. Maybe it's the sun. Maybe it's the air quality. But if we kind of ground ourselves in a moment, it's like maybe it's the food that we're eating or something like that, right? Um, mm-hmm. But in, in terms of our thoughts, we'll say, oh, it's the thinking. It's not the external mm. environment. It's not the other person. It's not our past. It's not the future. It's our thinking. Mm. Then we mm. come back to that, that, that truth. And we're like, okay, now I can let go of it because I know the source. And we, mm. we reclaim our agency in that sense. So that's S. And then E is experience. So experience your emotions fully without resistance. A lot of people think that letting go of our thinking is bypassing or spiritual bypassing, emotional bypassing. This is not what I'm advocating for at all. It's actually to let go of the judgment that we have of our emotions that we're experiencing. Mm. Because if we're judging our emotions, we're resisting it. And what we resist, it persists. Mm-hmm. That's why our emotions keep coming back up. It's because we're resisting it. But mm-hmm. when we drop our thinking, we're allowed, we then allow ourselves to experience the emotion fully. And once, and then our bodies are amazing. They just, if we get cut, do we have to will ourselves to heal? It just mm-hmm. heals on its own. Do we have to will our bodies to digest food? It just does it on its own. The same thing is true for our emotions. Our body naturally regulates and processes our emotions unless we get in the way of it by Mm. thinking about it and perpetuating it. And so if we allow our bodies, if we kind of step back and don't throw our wrench into the whole entire system, 
then our emotions will actually pass our bodies fairly quickly. I think neuroscience is now saying it takes about 90 seconds for our bodies to, to process an emotion. Mm -hmm. And if it takes longer than that, it's because we are restarting the cycle of the emotion by thinking about it and judging it. So wow. once we let that go, we can drop back into it very, very quickly. I mean, you can experience it in, in meditation. Most people me meditate for only a few minutes to 10 minutes, but that completely changes our physio physiology and emotional state. Um, so it doesn't take long for our bodies to really process these things. Um, and so that's the whole entire process. So it's, it's really just pausing, asking ourselves, is this thinking, making me feel the way that I want? Um, and just reminding ourselves we have the choice and letting go of that thinking and, and just experiencing our emotions without labeling, without judging it and just being there mm -hmm. and repeating the process, you know, the, the mantra too, right? Thinking is root cause of suffering and it, it, it will pass quicker than, 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 than you expect. And it's, it's quite amazing. And this is meant to be a practice throughout the whole entire day, not just 10 minutes in the morning, yeah. like my, my, my previous meditations. That's the beauty of this. <laughs> this, is, this is how we actually don't just do meditation in the morning, but how we can remain in a meditative state throughout the day. And so yes. if our boss says something to us, our friend says something to us, whatever happens, we can just take a step back, take a few minutes. It doesn't take longer than that to just ground ourselves and say, okay, thinking is the root cause of suffering taking deep breaths and just letting it go. And the more that we practice that, it's not about preventing negative emotions from popping up or negative thoughts by any means. It's it's shortening the time frame from which the negative emotions are staying within our systems because it's impossible to, to prevent negative emotions. That's just part of our experience. Of course, um, right. But it's about shortening it as much as we can. And that way we can always come back because we can't control external, experience, external circumstances. So there's no point in trying to manage that. Um, but we can always manage, okay, how long are we thinking about this? And mm -hmm. that is quite a superpower because then we become resilient to almost anything that happens. And that, that is extremely uh, impactful to, to our piece. I love the way that you lay that out in such a, an applicable way. And I can also see it working really well for people who maybe are experiencing flashbacks or trauma triggers because when you're in flashback, you can have a very tunnel-like vision of mm -hmm. the world. And it does, as you were saying, reduce your ability to problem solve and think outside the box. And so first and foremost, I can see it really helping when someone feels like this is the feeling I will feel forever. You realize, and I love the 90, I love research. So thank you for that 90 second nugget. Yes. That was so exciting. I'm definitely going to remember that. Um, and you know, also just the fact that it's, it's something that, you know, thinking about highly sensitive people, because we were definitely wanting to ask you about that. Yes. You know, highly sensitive people neurologically, they're finding are a bit more active in their amygdala and their limbic system. So they are essentially hardwired genetically to be more conscientious and to be thinking 10 steps ahead. You had said, earlier in our conversation, something about expectations and, and thinking that you know what's going to happen. And I can say as a HSP myself, I do think that I do think that we do tend to have that as a superpower that keeps us safe and keeps our kids safe and keeps our relationship safe and keeps empathy on board. But it's this, I think it almost becomes a false narrative that it's helpful to be like that all the time and or that yeah. it's effective to be like that all the time. And so I'm curious how you would speak to people who are high, hardwired, like highly sensitives, to be even deeper thinkers than the other 70% of the population. Yeah. So this is a fantastic question. Um, I'll start by saying for highly sensitive people, it, it is a defense mechanism to plan ahead, to try to project, to risk mitigate, and to try to think of every possible scenario that could go wrong to be mm -hmm. prepared. Mm. And to that, and sometimes they're right, right? And so, and, and is that through manifestation of whatever we've been conspiring about throughout the whole entire time? Or is that because of a different reason? We don't know. Um, but at the end of the day, at what cost are we doing this? Mm. And we don't really think about the cost. We always think the safety of ourselves, of our family, um, the happiness of them is, is paramount to everything else at the cost of our own peace and joy. 
and we don't see the damage that it's doing. We just think about, oh, they didn't get into an accident because of this, or they didn't go out at night because of this, or whatever happens, right? It, 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 it has this illusion of safety to it. Um, but what we usually don't see is how stressed we are all the time when we're thinking mm-hmm. like that. And how does that stress affect our relationship with our partner? Like, how is our communication with them? How's our communication with our kids when we're constantly Mm -hmm. overprotective and and checking in on them? And there's a lot of backlash there a lot of times. And it it, it makes the family members feel like we don't trust them, like they're not good enough or anything like that. And that is is certainly very true for parents that are are a little bit more overprotective. And that's how the kids feel. Um, But like anything in life, there's, there's really a balance, right? It's not like just letting everyone, there's not like never protecting our kids or our family and not... You know, planning or doing anything like that, it's really about balancing. Um, can we trust other people? Can we trust ourselves uh, in that way? Because, like, how many situations do we actually get in that are truly life threatening, like live or die? But that's how we feel like. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, I mean, not not many. <laughs> yeah, Luck- and, and, luckily, if you're lucky. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and so, if most situations are not live or die, why are we treating it like that? as if we're never going to see our kids again or partner or whatever it is. And so is it not better than to come from a place of instead of fear, but love? Mm -hmm. Um, But we will mask and say, oh, I'm doing this because I love them. Well, are we doing it because we love them or because we're very, very afraid of what's going to happen? And if we lose our entire family, we're not going to be able to live with ourselves. Mm -hmm. There's a very, it, it, it becomes very difficult to kind of discern what the true motives are. Mm-hmm. Um, but most of the time it does come out of fear versus love. And if we truly do love them, they say that, you know, we let them go. And it, it's, it's more about trusting than, than, than controlling in that case. Um, in my case, I'm highly certain that I am a highly sensitive person as well. Mm-hmm. Just because I grew up in an environment that was highly stressful because of, not because I was in stress because of myself, but because of my parents. Things were financially very difficult. Um, for most of our lives, they were living paycheck to paycheck, barely able to, I mean, our house almost foreclosed multiple times, um, mm. is, is very difficult for my parents. Um, and so they did our, their best in order to protect us from that by not really talking about it much. But as kids, you feel everything, mm. right. no matter what, what the parents hide from you or not, you can see it very clearly and how many arguments uh, kind of happen because of money or anything like that. So I learned from a very young age to kind of do everything I possibly could in order to help my parents feel at ease. So I was hyper vigilant, always assessing people's emotions. How are they feeling? What's the problem? Um, other people would constantly come to me for advice or help, even when I was like 10 years old, of like, what should they do in this situation and mm-hmm. these types of things. So I, I had to learn and adapt to that. And that was the coping mechanism, which was problem mm-hmm. solving, being there, being hyper vigilant. Um, but at the cost of my own peace, because I was always absorbing other people's emotions. And I didn't know I didn't, I didn't learn uh, early on how to set boundaries. How do I differentiate Mm -hmm. their emotions from mine? Because Mm -hmm. as uh, people who are a lot more empathetic or highly sensitive, they will just take on everything as if it is their own. Right. And they will say that it's their responsibility, even if it might might not be. Healing is every individual person's responsibility, not anyone else's. Even as therapists, right? You can't heal your clients for them, but you can help them heal themselves. No, that was the best advice I ever got from my favorite professor was Mm. to remind ourselves of a lack of omnipotence that I don't take credit for my client's wins and I don't take credit for their losses Yes, as long as I'm giving them my full attention and space right. when they're in my room, because otherwise I wouldn't be able to do this long-term. I'd be burnt out. I'd mm-hmm. be taking everything they did or did not do personally. And I'm realizing maybe that's something I should be doing in the rest of my life. <laughs> um, yes. Not it's just kind of with true. clients. Yes. But you know, you said something I think is, I, I, I'd like to, you know, just touch on really briefly that, you know, for highly sensitives or people who are empaths, we had spoke to a shaman named Bloom Post, love her. And she had said that highly sensitives are born, but empaths are made. And mm. I thought that was such a, such an important distinction and such, such an interesting thing to notice. And you can be highly sensitive and an empath as well, but that in the highly sensitive mind, sometimes someone being upset can feel like a danger. 
Mm. You know, yes. it, it's, it's the fear of upsetting someone or not pleasing someone or someone's feelings being hurt or people not being happy in a setting or, or the, the energy being off, like all these things can become these little mini fires that the highly sensitive brain wants to put out. And what I'm hearing you say is to check in, first of all, that you're doing it. <laughs> Am I doing this overthinking? Am I engaging in all this judgment? But at what cost? I, I really think that's a great mantra for highly sensitives. At what cost do I engage in this overthinking to put these fires out? And if it is at the cost of my peace and at the cost of my ability to actually engage, is it really worth it? Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And the questions, I love asking questions to myself and to other people too, but it's because it breaks the pattern of thinking. Mm -hmm. Yes. And because if we're continually thinking, we're just going to keep going down that, that well-worn path. But questions right. kind of break that, right? Like an object in motion will stay in motion unless acted upon by an external force. Questions act like an external force within our minds to then stop that thinking and create space for new thoughts, new ideas, uh, just anything, new possibilities to enter. Right. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, asking questions is one of the most powerful ways to do that. And yeah, for highly sensitive people, it's it's not that trait. A lot of times we will say that is a, it's it can be quote unquote like, a negative thing but at the same time if you kind of hone that skill you can then differentiate this is what the other person's feeling not me and i don't have to take that on but what that allows you to do is then notice when someone is suffering mm -hmm. and be able to guide them from a, from a more objective way um unattached way right and that's how you can actually love someone instead of conditionally unconditionally conditional love says I need to fix this person's problems or however they're feeling in order for me to feel like I'm enough or that mm -hmm. I'm a good person. Mm -hmm. But that's conditional love. Unconditional love says that person's going through a very hard time right now. I'm going to love them anyway, regardless of what they do. Even if they still go back to the same patterns, do the same things, continually doing a lot of the, the, the um, harm to themselves, I'm going to let them do that, but I'm going to love them as much as I can and be there to support them. And that type of love really changes someone because then you're actually able to listen to the other person and what they're going through rather than trying to change them. No yes. one wants to feel like they, they, like, like they're a problem or mm -hmm, that right. everything they're doing is wrong. Mm -hmm. um, but if someone really does lend an ear in that, in that way, a very unattached way, it, and they truly feel like they're heard, that transforms somebody. Mm -hmm. um, and that's probably the best thing I've done with other people. Even my parents too. A lot of times I, 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 I they they might have problems or something like that and in work or in business or whatever it is. And a lot of times they just repeat the same patterns and I just have to sit there, listen and support them and love them no matter what. And it takes longer, right. In, in mm -hmm. terms of that, but I get to protect my peace and then they get to still have their agency. And over time they just say, I'm done with this. I, I'm, I'm done retelling the same story. I'm done reliving the same story. Mm -hmm. And then they change. And it, it's a beautiful process that uh, where you don't feel like you have to be forced in, in that way. Yeah. I really appreciate how you've taken what you created for everyone and applied it to not just, and everyone, I mean the human race, <laughs> and not just how can I unthink for myself, but for us highly sensitives, we have bigger buy-in if it has to do yeah. with our relationships and our connections, and so how to apply that elsewhere. I'm curious if people want to learn more about this, learn more about your offerings. I'm actually curious personally. Yeah. <laughs> um, what kind of offerings do you have and where can our listeners continue on this journey with you? Yes. Um, the best way is probably through my website. You can also sign up for my newsletter. So that's josephwin.org slash newsletter. Um, Joseph and win is spelled n-g-u-y-e-n dot -E org slash newsletter and then i also have a youtube channel if you just type in my first and last name i'll show up there those are probably the two best spots to be able to find me and also my other work and, and anything like that and you can find all my books on amazon that's probably the easiest way uh, or through my website too that's wonderful awesome. and we'll have all of those links in the show notes if you missed any of that you can still go down to the show notes and click anywhere you want to go <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Joseph, thank you so much. Personally, I, I've, I've really appreciated this conversation and I am so excited to share this with people I love and just all of our listeners. So thank you again so much for coming on the Sensitivity Doctors. Thank, yeah, you. thank you so much for having me. It was such a beautiful <laughs> yes. conversation and 
yeah, it, it was just all around so much love and, and joy and gratitude. And I mean, just hearing how you've already brought it to clients and how, you know, you've seen the effects of it already. That's, that means more than the world to me. And um, yeah, it's not really about me. It's, it's, it's about what other people are experiencing and how they can change their, their reality. And yeah, you're doing amazing work and your impact is, is truly uh, immeasurable. So thank you for the work that you do. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Bye. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Sensitivity Doctors. Please be sure to share our video clips on socials and ask your friends to rate and review this podcast. Yes, sharing these videos makes it possible for your favorite podcast to move up on the ranks so that other people can find it, share it, and learn from it too. So if you can share today, we would really appreciate it.